I am Nancy Tavellato. I am a researcher with the IAC, International Academy of Consciousness. Well, uh, we just concluded our first International Congress of Conscientiology, Consciousness Science, and I have the pleasure to talk to Dr. Brenda Dunn today. She presented a super interesting work, Consciousness and the Nature of Life. It's actually about a work she developed with Dr. Robert Jan. He could not be with us this time, but it was a very interesting material for us to discuss about. Uh, for you to know a little bit about um, Dr. Brenda Dunn, she is now the president and treasurer of the International Consciousness Research Laboratory um, based in the United States. Um, and she was the laboratory manager of the Principal Engineering Anomaly Research, Anomaly Research, sorry, uh, is known as the Per Lab. And um, she is part, she was part of the Per Lab. Now it's no longer, it, it's closed since 2007. But she is there or was there since the very beginning. So we also want to hear from her how was the experience of establishing such a lab um, to do research on anomalies of um, consciousness, mind, energy. I believe that was um, challenging at the time. Um, and she is now also an officer of the Society for Scienti Scientific Exploration. Anyway, let's now explore her knowledge together, okay? Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for accepting after a long weekend with so much work. It was very kind of you. It's a great pleasure to have you here. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for including me. This yes. has been a delightful experience. I hope so. It was very nice indeed. Um, a doctor then, maybe the um, best thing is to start telling how you started doing this work, how it all began, because um, 1979 perhaps was when um, most of the research on these started to go deeper. Um, so how was it? Well, I got involved in this topic uh, almost by accident. Mm -hmm. I had uh, returned to finish my education uh, a little bit later than most people. I had gotten married early and I was raising my family and so forth. And um, in uh, one of my studies, I uh, was required to do uh, an independent research project. Mm -hmm. And my professor uh, had given me an article written by uh, doctors uh, Harold Putoff and Russell Targ, who were then at SRI International in California. And they were reporting on some work on what they called remote viewing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I read this paper, and I found it very interesting. The... Um, uh, the thing that got me particularly intrigued was in the article they mentioned that, uh, well, I should point out to your audience that isn't familiar with it, remote viewing is a phenomenon where an individual attempts to describe a distant scene with no sensory input. So a second person would be going to the scene, but the uh, dis person describing it has no way of knowing where they're going to be. And uh, in this particular article, they said that there were some people who could describe the scene before it was selected. And uh, that bothered me. <laughs> Somehow said something here not so It was, uh, you know, something that, as I'm sure many people have trouble accommodating their minds to. And I uh, was thinking about this a lot. And finally, one day, it was a Sunday afternoon, I was doing laundry, folding towels. Mm -hmm. Nothing very profound. And I thought, hmm, maybe I'll just try it. Uh, I will think about a friend of mine who doesn't know I'm thinking about her. And uh, it was about four in the afternoon. And I said, I'll see if I can picture where she's going to be at five o'clock. And then I can call her this evening and see where she was. So I no sooner had this thought then I had this, not 
quite a picture, but a sense of her walking in the woods, which is not something that was typical for her. Okay? And I thought, well, I, that's all I could think of. I did not try to meditate or anything. That was, okay, I'll call her later. Well, about a half hour from then, my doorbell rang, and my friend was standing there. She said, it's such a nice day, I have to get out of the house. I was thinking of going for a walk in the woods. Would you like to come? And I went, yeah. <laughs> and she was indeed walking in the woods, and I was walking with her at the time. And that blew my mind. I said, okay, I have to try this. And so I proceeded to set up a more small but more formal replication study of the work at SRI. Uh, we did eight trials with other people, but people who did not have any unusual abilities, just some friends or fellow students. And we got some rather striking results. People seem to be able to describe these scenes ahead of time uh, in much more detail than they would have just guessed. And I was totally hooked by that time. And so I continued to do more of these uh, longer distances, longer time separations. I tried it with two people instead of one. And um, then it was about two years later, I was at a professional meeting of uh, the parapsychology community and to give a talk about this work. And uh, it just happened that Professor John was there. He had become interested in the field also through a student project that he had supervised. In this case, it was a student who had proposed doing a study where people would attempt to affect the output of an electronic random event generator. He also had seen some very intriguing results and felt that as an engineer, uh, this was something that had potential uh, implications for engineering that were important. I should mention that he was at the time the Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Science at Princeton University. And his own area of study was in aerospace science, okay, rocket propulsion. Yes. A, a real area. rocket yes. scientist. <laughs> and he was thinking about setting up a program at Princeton where he might address this more carefully. And so he was going around and talking to people and, you know, trying to see who was out there and so forth. So uh, I uh, was given an opportunity. I, I was supposed to speak originally for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I was very nervous. I had never done this before. And then uh, that morning they told me, oh, we're sorry, you only have 10 minutes. Oh. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, I'll never be able to do this in 10 minutes. And just before I got up to speak, they said, I'm sorry, we're running late. You have five minutes. At that point, I got mad. I got really mad. I got so mad that I forgot to be nervous. And I said, well, I don't know how I'm going to do this because I had five experiment trials I wanted to describe. And so I just stood there. I said, I'm sorry, I have very limited time. I can't describe the protocol. You'll have to read about it. All I can do is show you the empirical results, one minute at a time. Mm -hmm. And I saved the best one for last, which was an experiment that was took place over 5,000 miles, 24 hours ahead of time, and between um, the United States and Eastern Europe. Oh. Now, this was back... Yeah. When there was an iron curtain, 
And I can tell you that iron curtains do not shield against no. remote <laughs> viewing. It's penetrable. <laughs> so I reported these, and at the end, the audience went, oh. and the, uh, uh, the, the, the chairman the stood up and said, I'm sorry, you're out of time. And I smiled at him, and I said, oh, that's okay, I have nothing more to say. <laughs> And uh, then they had a coffee break. And when I went out into the, the lobby, uh, somebody came up to me and said, have you uh, met Dean John? And not only had I not met him, I had no idea who he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, I said, well, point him out. And he said, uh, well, I'll introduce you. So we had a very momentous meeting. I went over to him and I said, uh, hello, I'm Brenda Dunn. I understand you were looking for me. And he looked at me and said, you might say that. <laughs> and that was our first conversation. Okay. The beginning of a the long beginning of a very long yes, partnership. Yes. And uh, he said he thought my presentation was very good. And what did I plan to do next? And I said, well, I've been thinking that uh, the phenomenon is interesting, but there is a problem, I think, with the evaluation of the data. And I think we need to find a more objective, standardized method. And he said, have you considered looking at descriptors? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, having a list of que questions and I said, brilliant. And within this five-minute conversation, we had developed a methodology, a methodology that we pursued over the next term. But it was very clear that we thought well together. We saw things the same way. And he asked me if I would be interested in coming to Princeton. And I very quietly and humbly said, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> you, you lived in Princeton at that time. Huh? You lived in Princeton. I lived in the Chicago area at the time. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, I had recently become divorced. I had mm -hmm. recently sold my house. So everything was changing. It was perfect. I time. was ready yes. to do something. And uh, so the following year, he proceeded to set up this program. And I joined him there in uh, the following June. And we established the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Laboratory in June of 1979. Which produced many interesting research. Let us hold that just for a second. We are going to make a quick break, but I want to go back exactly to that point when we return. Okay. We'll be back in a moment for more consciousness and silence. Yes. <laughs> Program Consciousness and Science. We are talking today with Dr. Brenda Dunn. She just presented work at the first International Congress of Conscientiology, Consciousness Science, organized by the IAC. And uh, the work she presented is something she developed with Dr. Robert Dunn, Consciousness and the Nature of Life. We are actually hearing her story about how it all began. So you were saying then you started the work at the Paralab. All right. Uh, from the very beginning, we agreed there would be two main uh, parts of the program based on our two approaches. One would be a, a, an array of experiments in human-machine interactions, basically taking off from the student project, where there would be a variety of random physical systems and devices that would could produce a distribution function and see if uh, people could affect uh, the movement of that, the mean of that distribution in accordance with their uh, intentions. The other portion, of course, was what I just described, developing these quantitative methods for measuring 
uh, the information acquired in what we came to call remote perception. Mm -hmm. Because it seemed to be more than just viewing. Yes. And um, the, um, the program was primarily an engineering program. We had uh, a bit of difficulty in getting approval for it. Fortunately, Professor John was the dean of the engineering school. He had tenure. He was well respected, although they, many of his colleagues thought he had lost his mind. Mm. Um, and by the way, if I may say, both of you were very, perhaps, different style professor because most would not even hear about that, not even dare to go to that area. So I can imagine what people <laughs> thought of you. <laughs> it was uh, it was interesting. And uh, there, there's a wonderful quote by uh, Frederick Nietzsche, the philosopher, who said, I love my enemies because they bring out the best in me. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> and, uh, but there were constraints on the program. Mm -hmm. uh, we were not allowed to do any kind of psychological testing or physiological testing. Uh, as I mentioned in my talk, one of the more amusing anecdotes was when they reviewed our protocols for approval, they said, well, this is fine as long as you make sure that your participants do not suffer from delusions of metaphysical capabilities. Oh, boy. <laughs> And um, actually, this was rather uh, a favor mm -hmm. because when people would come into our laboratory, no matter how hard we tried to create a comfortable and friendly environment, they would be a little nervous. And I would greet them and say, now, before we begin the experiments, I must tell you that no matter what happens in these experiments, you must not leave here thinking you are God unless you thought you were God when you came in. <laughs> and they would laugh. And that relaxed them, and it worked very well. But, it, uh, you know, we could not teach a course. We could, you know, they were really worried that we were going to embarrass the university. Mm -hmm. I have to say, however, that this, in spite of their reluctance and discomfort, uh, they did tolerate the program yeah. for that nearly three decades. Yeah. I think they were glad to see yeah. us leave. <laughs> but uh, they did respect, you know, academic freedom, and they allowed us, as long as we did not create an embarrassment or become sensationalistic, yeah. which was fine with us. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. And so we, uh, we, we proceeded to do the, these two areas of research. Over the years, we collected maybe the largest database of millions of trials um, in, well, certainly in the human machine experiments, close to a thousand trials in the remote perception. We learned a great deal. Uh, we tried different variables of distance, of time, of groups, of, you know, uh, and, um, much of what we learned was what these phenomena were not. We did get results that were uh, well beyond chance. There was no question that they were real effects. But they were very small effects. You could never point to any one particular trial and say this was the anomalous one. Yeah, like it's final. It was only in the combination of these many thousands of trials that you saw that saw this statistical uh, shift. So when people were trying to shift the effect, say, to the positive side, the mean would shift a little bit. And when they would try to shift it to the negative side, it would shift a little bit that way. And those tests were done with a random generator, right? With, yes, and various, not only the little uh, microelectronic one, but we also had a great big pinball machine. Oh, okay. Uh, Could you 10 feet high. I see. 
uh, six feet wide. And was that much of exciting to play with that? <laughs> it was. It dropped 9,000 little marbles, three-quarter inch marbles, through a maze of 300 and some odd pegs, like a big uh, pinball machine. Can you explain to our audience what was the idea and how did someone would influence the generators, just for those who are not familiar with that? Okay, well, uh, as these 9,000 marbles were mm -hmm. taken up to the top, they would fall down and dance, if you will, mm -hmm. among the pegs and fall into an array of 18 uh, collecting bins at the bottom, okay? And a court consistent with the laws of probability, they would distribute as a Gaussian or bell-shaped curve. So you have more balls in the middle and fewer and fewer as you move to the sides. There were little counters, uh, so the balls would be counted, and you can see how many balls were in each bin. And people would sit maybe six, seven feet away from the machine on a sofa and uh, run the machine in three uh, three runs per session. Mm -hmm. One where they would attempt to shift the mean to the right, one where they would attempt to shift it to the left, and one where they wouldn't attempt anything and just let it run as a baseline. Mm -hmm. And the order of these was randomly uh, mixed. Mm -hmm. The data were recorded online in a computer file as well as pictures to add to make it a log book, you know, and over some, oh, many thousand, I don't remember all the exact number of these trials, we did see a significant correlation with these intentions, these pre-recorded intentions, and these slight shifts of the mean. Could not tell which ball was the magic one. All you could see was that the probabilities have shifted slightly. And this was true in all of our experiments. It seemed that this was not psychokinesis. There was no physical effect that you could measure. Mm -hmm. There was a slight change in the informational content. These otherwise random processes were becoming a little bit less random. Thank you. And that reduction of the entropy mm -hmm. uh, of the randomness seemed to be correlated with what the operators wanted. wanted. The intention there. Hmm. Now, they also told us very often that they would say, well, the intention uh, is important, but it is, uh, as they say in academia, necessary but not sufficient. Mm -hmm. That they needed to do something more than have an intention. Mm -hmm. They needed to have a feeling. They needed to feel a connection with the device, with the process. Um, some of them would say, you know, it's like a musician with their instrument. Mm -hmm. They develop the bond, or a person with their car, or, you know, but it becomes an extension uh, of oneself. Mm -hmm. The, um, and that is important. If I don't have that feeling of being at one with the machine, uh, they would sometimes say being on the same wavelength, which made us think and describe this in terms of resonance, okay, okay mm -hmm. which is a nice way of yes. saying being on the same wavelength. It's also a nice way of saying experiencing love. Yes. But in science, you, you, can, something yeah, in yes. science you, you can't can describe it as love. Yes. yes. But you can say resonance. Yes. So. <laughs> And uh, we saw this uh, over and over again. We heard people talk about this. Also in the remote perception, people had to feel some connection with the other person. And um, then we tried some experiments where, uh, well, let me try something else and come back. We looked at these experiments also in terms of distance. Okay. We found that people could affect these machines, have the very same effects if they were 
down the hall, mm -hmm. across the town, mm -hmm. across the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, they could be thinking about the machine running three days before it ran, or four days afterwards. And there was no difference in the effect. It was independent of the distance, either temporally or spatially. It was not a physical presence. It was Which could not be explained by a yes. known physical process. Um, we also found that we, we developed these little portable devices that we could take out into the field. We came to call that field rig, rig for random event mm -hmm. generator. Mm -hmm. And because we wanted to look at this resonance idea, you know, in the laboratory you can tell people, go left, go right. Yeah. But you can't say feel resonant, don't feel resonant. Yeah. Yeah. But we would take these two situations that lent themselves, maybe it was a meditation group, maybe it was a religious service, maybe it was a concert. And we found that when these devices were running in such resonant environments, the output was showing, again, this increase in order. When we took them to boring, you know, business meetings or whatever, there's no change. So we then decided to try uh, an experiment where we would have two people work together. And again, we found something curious. Mm -hmm. the, uh, when the two people were of opposite sex, man and woman, the effects were about twice as large as these individuals got by themselves. People of the same sex, no matter how well they did as individuals, were producing chance, almost as if their effects canceled. And if they happened to be uh, in love with each other, the results they were getting were about seven times larger. Well, this, of course, you know, what could explain what could explain <laughs> this? Why should this have anything to do with uh, with this effect? And um, this led us to go back and look at all of our experiments up until that time, probably 20 years worth by then. And although we could not study the people, mm -hmm. we could figure out which ones were men and which ones were women mm -hmm. without interviewing them. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we had about half and half, and there were several hundred people by then who had participated. And much to our amazement, totally unexpectedly, we found that they were producing different kinds of effects. The men were getting effects that were in the direction they wanted. Their highs were going slightly high, their lows were going slightly low, their baselines, if anything, were too well behaved, mm -hmm. the variance was too small. And uh, the women, on the other hand, their high efforts were very high. So were their low efforts, <laughs> and so were their baseline efforts. The women tended to not care about which direction, but they got much larger effects. So, of course, when you had a man and a woman together, you had the male directionality, you had the female amplitude. Both effects. And this was really what led us uh, to start wondering about uh, what, what we were looking at. Yes, yes. Um, I can imagine there were some ideas derived yeah. from We that. We had developed a few theories, theories or models, you know, conceptual models. But this business was, this was not a physical process. This was not a psychological process. It worked better, for example, when people did not think. I see. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Let us hold that just for a second. Okay. So we need a little break. And we'll be right back with you with more Consciousness and Science. Welcome back to the program.
program Consciousness and Science. We are talking today with Brenda Dunn. Um, we were discussing about her work and her research in the Pear Lab. Um, she presented work with us about consciousness and the nature of life. It's quite interesting talk, actually. I wish we had more time. Um, we were discussing about the effects that the subject produced with the brain mm-hmm. generator. And you mentioned a point that I was um, going to ask you about how much the person had to be conscious of what was going on, how much was just the intention, how much was just doing it without thinking much. Um, what were your perceptions on that? Well, as I pointed out, this was not something we could study in a formal way. Mm-hmm. Much of that was observation. Yes. Our formal experiments only looked at the correlations with pre-recorded intention. But we are people who did the experiments to tell us that you need this feeling that it was necessary to have an intention, to set a goal, but then one had to let go and just be one with the machine and not think about it. Mm -hmm. And usually they said they would be distracted by other things, they would meditate, they would uh, just stare into space, but the more they would let go, the better their results were. Now, there are some people who refer to these phenomena as anomalous cognition. I don't like that term myself because I don't think it's cognition at all. Uh, This seems to be most effective when you are not thinking or analyzing or observing or paying attention. Rationalizing. Yeah. It seems to work best when you're just being. Mm -hmm. Uh, You put the intention out and then you let let it be. Um, People frequently would say, well, what is it you do? And we would say, you don't do, you be. (laughs) You just, and you have to, uh, you have to accept that it works. You know, just let it, let it be, don't challenge it, don't question it. If it doesn't work, don't worry about it. And um, this was, uh, so you needed a little of both. And I think that may be where you, the, the males were so much better at the intentionality. The females were better at the connecting. Um, we, uh, when we went back to look at the gender differences, we also did a very intensive study of gender differences in the literature. And turns out there are only two real things that they know for sure. One of them is that men are better than women on the average at spatial orientation. Mm -hmm. This, of course, solves the age-old problem of why men don't ask directions. (laughs) I felt this was a great accomplishment. (laughs) Um, The women, females, on the other hand, are better at communication skills. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm thinking, you know, This is sort of like uh, in nature. So many creatures, particularly mammalian creatures, the males go off and they designate territory and protect it and defend it. Uh, The females tend to gather in groups to protect the young, to hunt, to, you know, you watch the cubs while I go hunt for dinner. Um, And maybe... What we're seeing here is something that is more akin to something biological rather than, it certainly is not psychological. It's almost anti-psychological. It cannot be explained in terms of any known principle of physics. Mm -hmm. And most people who have approached the topic have approached it from that stamp, one of those. And you know, you say, well, what is it in nature where a lot of effects, a lot of little effects could build up to shift a distribution slightly. Where would you see gender differences 
where would you see random processes that have output distributions? Uh, and of course, before too long, you'd say, well, you know, we're looking at evolution. Yeah. We're looking at something that is not, um, I'm fond of saying this is the solution to the mind-body problem. Uh, a mind that has no body has a problem. A body that has no mind has a problem. A mind with a body is a living system. And what we seem to be looking at here is some life force, an elan vital, a uh, process that is not limited to humans, but to any living system. And it fits the, uh, what we know of evolution and biology and genetics and recombination and so forth. So we were rather excited about that, and uh, this is, of course, what my presentation was. Um, we are thinking of perhaps collecting some essays uh, and preparing an anthology, which brings me to what we're doing now. Uh, the Pear Laboratory closed in 2007. There were people who thought, and the rumor got out that, oh, the university shut them down. That's not true. If they could have, they would have long before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we shut down because, well, Professor John had reached a retirement age. We were getting bored. I mean, there's just so many bits yes, you can count without years, going yes, into. Yeah. I mean, we've done it. We've seen it. We've learned whatever yeah. we had to learn so from what we, we wanted could to do go there. Step further, yes. And we could not really go beyond those constraints. So a few years before we shut down, we started a small not-for-profit mm -hmm. organization with some colleagues called International Consciousness Research Laboratories. I am so proud of the fact that several of our members are here presenting. Oh, that's, that's good. <laughs> and uh, I feel like a mother, you know. Yes. I totally can understand that. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we have a family, an extended mm -hmm. family, many of them young people. Yeah. Oh, Nelson, Thomas, uh, the, the, uh, uh, some of the Nini and the Corpo, and they were uh, interested, they maintained an interest, but they wanted to do their thing, and it was wonderful, because we could serve in an advisory capacity. We didn't really want to do any more experiments yeah. ourselves. From my point of view, I have seen all the statistics yes. I ever want oh, to see. Yes. So you wanted to provide maybe an environment or conditions right. for others to bring their ideas. Right. And okay. also to uh, put the information out into the world. So one thing ICRL did early on was we created a small niche publishing company called the ICRL Press. Mm -hmm. We have had some of our books here. We've published now... Uh, ten books. We have three more in preparation. And they deal with different aspects of consciousness and spirituality. And the interface between science and spirit. We like the idea of maintaining science in its true sense of learning and growing, exploring. But not to forget that Science, in the fullest sense, is a spiritual process, and it requires certain it requires a certain humility. Yes, definitely. It requires a uh, a willingness to be wrong, courage to be wrong. <laughs> uh, they don't teach you in science school how to say, "I was wrong." <laughs> They don't teach you how to say, I don't know, either. And yet, you cannot be a scientist without saying yes, such things. Yes, so thank you. Yeah. So, we, um, we are preparing books. We have 
small meetings uh, in our nearby on different related topics with guest speakers. We have um, a whole series of podcasts, and, and basically we are Bob, John, and I are like uh, uh, mom and pop. <laughs> Uh, we're there to provide mentorship, encouragement, advice if needed. Advice even yeah. if it isn't needed. Yeah. I like to give people advice. Yeah. You know, yeah, then with your experience, <laughs> and you are open to that, so I think you can contribute this, a lot. This is another gender difference. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be quite interesting to have that. Um, it's interesting because you said something that I think it's super important. The idea that we may be wrong. Because we cannot do science, and IEC is placing great effort into that. Like, of course, we have theories, we have models to explain all of this, but if we are not open to hear others, to compare, and to say, maybe my truth is just partially true, or maybe it's not true at all, and to combine with other point of view, how can we really grow? But it's very difficult to do that in science, because whoever has an idea, it's this is, this is mine and this is the right. truth, and we would like also um, to provide a platform for people to discuss. We have our journal, the Journal mm -hmm. of Cultural Geology, that we would love to be a place for people you know, to publish and discuss. But, Brenda, and that's something I wanted to bring, many people feel like I'm going to publish in a place that is study things that are not purely physical. How am I going to be seen? Mm -hmm. So that is the problem. The other thing, many, many do not even look at the paper, do not even look at the intention behind that or the methodology so that true. was used. They simply have a prejudice and you are immediately a religion. You are immediately a dogma. I think some people, they are afraid. They are really afraid. Oh, yes. That is the point behind it. Because they feel like, what if the world is not so certain and physical? And then I have to learn that I have to have principles that go beyond right. just my yeah. personal yeah. interest my pocket, write my name in the book, in this mm -hmm. sort of thing, and there are other things going on. I think part of it must be that. But I understand the fear of some scientists and their scientists. Well, there's also. another fear. Yeah. Uh, there's a fear of, of the loss of control. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, okay. You know, I think one of the most profound discoveries of science in the last hundred years was the principle of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, to me, was monumental. And, you know, in living systems, there always has to be some uncertainty. Otherwise, you're dead. You have to be able to adapt, to change, to adjust. Uh, but we live in a, certainly in many Western countries, in a society that wants to know absolute yes. truth. Yes. There, there is no absolute yes. truth. Yes. Much less in regards to human beings. And what's more, when you deal with uncertainty, yes. uh, you are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, when you are dealing with consciousness of this sort, uh, you have to take responsibility. I hate to tell you how many times some scientist would frown at me and say, you know, your stuff can't possibly be right, because if you're right, then everything I've ever done is wrong. <laughs> and I'd say, no, it's just not complete. Yeah. No, 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 you don't understand. It would be yeah. wrong. Well, what's, what's so terrible about being wrong? Yeah. You know? Even if it were. But the thought of being wrong scares them. Yeah. What I find, I, I agree with you. Where it bothers me the most yeah. is these are the people who are teaching our young people. Yes, and training them that to be scientific is to be that skeptical. But skeptical yeah. is actually close-minded. I was going to say that I think some of these people who reject immediately, they think if you study anything that's not purely material, you are bringing religion and dogma and beliefs into science. And I think they are being dogmatic. They are yes. the ones that are being religious about science. Because if in the universe we examine a phenomenon, if we notice there is an experience, 
and different between human beings. But we don't acknowledge that they study scientifically. They are the ones that do yes. the gymnastics. But because they are speaking like uh, you cannot prove, then therefore they have the power to say I more. I have heard people <laughs> say, well, you're taking science back to the days of superstition before, uh, you know, Sir Francis Bacon and Galileo said it right. And it's like, but you don't understand. Sir Francis, uh, Sir Isaac Newton was an alchemist. All of these people were metaphysicians. They were interested in metaphysics. They were interested in religion. They were interested in spirituality. Um, the, uh, the scientific revolution began because they didn't want the dogmatic church telling them what they could ask. Yeah, yeah. Then they became what they were afraid of. Yeah. Yeah. And now they are the dogmatic yeah. church. Yeah. And, but we, we need to find that balance again. And maybe this is what this yin-yang, masculine, yeah. feminine is all about. That we need to find a, a balance there. You had asked where I think uh, science is going to go. Everything I have seen since I'm here at IAC uh, answers that question for me. This is where I think it's going to go. It's going to, or where I hope it will go. It, where we can integrate good, solid, reasonable thinking with an openness to the subjective, spiritual dimensions of ourselves, to come to trust our spirit as well as we depend on our minds, and to recognize that... Uh, I remember a visitor who said once, I'm so tired of having to choose between my head and my heart. I have both, you know. Yes, yes. that is the point. And that is where I would like to see science go. I would like to see more women in science, not because of being a feminist or whatever. Too many women who are in science are far too masculine in their approach. But I think we have a different complementary way of approaching things that help, is too helpful. Help, yeah. Over the years, Bob, John, and I, who come from such different universes, managed to do have that. found that we were able to do together what neither of us could do alone. Because we had different styles, different ways of looking, but we respected each other, we trusted each other, and we were open to learning from each other. He was a much more yes. reserved, yes. you know, acad academic. I was a crazy ex hippie yeah. type it person. It would be nice to see that more equality and more space and less prejudice yes. and all of that. Yes. But it was so fascinating that when we would come into a situation, he would approach it from his angle and I would approach it from mine, and they were quite orthogonal. Yeah. And yet, would be synergistic. more often than not, we would come to the same conclusion, having approached it from two different directions. Oh, I can identify with that very much. <laughs> I'm sure you can. And you know, when we didn't come to the same conclusion, one of us was usually wrong. Yes, usually that's the sign. And if, it was, if, it, if it was I who was wrong, I would not be happy. <laughs> But uh, seriously, I think we need that. Yeah. It's that complementarity in the yin and the yang, in the spirit and the mind. But it's so difficult for people, isn't it, to deal with others that have different styles of work, and especially men and women, and to go well with each other, in the, in the, even in our workplace. So it's amazing. Brenda, it's so delightful talking to you. I told you before, you are a great, great speaker, and I love talking to you. I hope oh, in our you. next Congress we also get to meet Dr. Robert Jan. I hope Maybe so too. if we go to U.S., instead of being Portugal, he would that be able would to be, join. That would be Because wonderful. I can understand, you know, an overseas trip is not so easy. I must yeah. add that he has sent his apologies and his regrets. He would have liked so much to be here. 
I've been calling him each day to tell him what's happening. But he just was not up to making that trip right now. He has to give a talk next week. Yeah, I think it's a long trip. And uh, this is the travel it tires him quite a bit yeah. now. But he did he did send his greetings and assured us that he would be with us in spirit. And I I, I feel his that. presence. Very good, great. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, um, Thanks my to all of you. It was very interesting for me. I hope it was interesting to you to hear about the backstage of all of this work. Thank you very much. See you next time for more consciousness inside.